Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalk's Topics in Neurorehabilitation webcast. I'm Kathleen O'Donnell, and today we'll be talking again with Professor Lou Awad. Lou is an assistant professor of physical therapy at Boston University, where he is also the founding director of the Neuromotor Recovery Laboratory. Lou has been critical in spearheading much of the early research on exosuits for stroke rehabilitation and has published extensively on his findings. Lou was also the site investigator at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, where he led the site's activities in the Restore clinical trial. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice that Lou's talk today was actually recorded in two parts. We originally recorded this episode to build upon Lou's previous talk and highlight his research on how exosuits can help to address propulsion asymmetry post-stroke. But we reached out to record a new section on the Restore clinical trial after Lou helped to co-author a paper with the other site investigators summarizing the trial results. Hi, Lou. It's great to talk with you today. Hi, Kathleen. Thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. You know, Lou, I, I can't wait to hear this talk because exosuits are really such a new technology and, and really a new field in research. And there's so much that we're still learning all the time about what they can do and how we can best utilize them in rehabilitation settings. Um, and I think, you know, every time that you and I talk about a particular research question, we end up coming up with four or five new studies that we want to see run. Um, so definitely a really exciting area. Um, and since it's such a new field of technology for a lot of our viewers, I'd love to start a discussion going in the comments section uh, just to hear it from all of you guys about some of the questions that you have about exosuits for stroke rehabilitation um, and maybe some of the things that you would like to see addressed in upcoming research studies. Um, and maybe Lou will we'll end up crowdsourcing your next grant topic for you or something. Uh, so to our viewers, let us know your thoughts in the comments and please remember to like and subscribe to this video if you want to see more talks like this one. Uh, and with that, Lou, I will let you take things from here. Yep. Uh, thanks, Kathleen. And crowdsourcing our next uh, idea would be great, but crowdfunding our next research project might even be better. <laughs> All right, we'll see what we can do for you on that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. In my uh, previous talk in the series, I described the concept of locomotor propulsion, its importance to a fast and economical gait, and the functional and biomechanical consequences of impaired propulsion after stroke. Now, I also shared our team's central hypothesis that in people with post-stroke hemiparesis, soft robotic exosuits that operate in parallel with the impaired paretic muscles can functionally restore the plantar flexor function crucial to forward propulsion, and by extension, increase the speed, stability, and economy of post-stroke walking during both rehabilitation and day-to-day -day walking activities. My talk today will overview some of our work to date developing and studying exosuits. At a high level, exosuits consist of, a, of compressive garments worn like clothing around the waist and lower limb. The bulk of the exosuit's weight is in the motor and batteries that are worn proximally at the waist. The contractile elements of the exosuit are two Bowden cables, uh, which are the equivalent of bike cables, that travel from the motor pack worn at the waist to the functional textile wrap worn around the shank. And these cables pull on an insole that goes into any shoe. Now, one of these cables runs in front of the ankle, right over here, so that when it contracts, it generates a dorsiflexion moment to lift the toes and facilitate ground clearance. The other cable runs behind the ankle so that when it contracts, it generates a plantar flexion moment that helps push the foot into the ground for propulsion. Now, force and movement sensors integrated into the exosuit allow for its control. In this video, we show a close-up of the ankle during walking with an illustration of the forces that are being applied. Briefly, during the predic stance phase, the cable located behind the ankle, over here, <clears throat> uh, begins to contract and thus generates a plantar flexion moment. Now, when the predic limb is behind the body, this plantar flexion moment which results in a propulsive force. Then a paretic toe off, the tension in the plantar flexor cable is released. And the dorsiflexion cable located in front of the ankle over here begins to contract. Now this results in a dorsiflexor moment during swing phase that acts to reduce paretic drop foot and help clear the ground. 
Then at initial contact, the tension in the dorsiflexor cable is released and the cycle repeats itself with plantar flexion support during stance and dorsiflexion support during swing. So clinically, we are most interested in looking at how wearing an exosuit influences the user. But you can look at that influence across different categories. The first one here is the immediate effects. And what I mean by that is when you turn on the device, what happens to the user's gait, their movement patterns, while they're walking with the device powered on? And then the second category is a therapeutic effect. So beyond an immediate effect, is there a therapeutic effect where after a period of training with the exosuit, if you get rid of the exosuit, is there a lasting improvement in the individual's walking ability? And then the last category is retention. And what I mean by that is when you get rid of the exosuit, there might be some lasting change, but how long does that change last? Is it days? Is it weeks? Is it minutes? Okay. And these are the domains that we think about when we think about rehab interventions. When I, when I deliver the intervention, is there a change? When I get rid of the intervention, is there some retention of that change? And how long does that last over time? So our, our first uh, area of work was looking at the immediate effects. And we've got a number of papers and conference uh, work that shows basically when you compare walking with a device not powered to powered, we can see changes across the board. And I'm gonna focus on our key, folk, uh, our key variables that we wanted to focus on. And these were the targets of the device, improving clearance with the dorsiflexion assistance and improving propulsion. So uh, over here, this is the dorsiflexion angle during swing. This is where the foot is um, in the swing phase. And this negative value here under zero means the foot is plantar flexed. So the toe can catch the ground and cause a person to trip and fall. When you power the device, it goes from negative to positive. So from negative two to four, this is an average across, I think this was seven people or nine people. And you see an increase, uh, not only in, in the magnitude, but change in direction from negative to positive. So check, it helps with ground clearance. It does the job that an ankle foot orthosis does. So if we stop right here, we'd say the exosuit is as good as an ankle foot orthosis. But of course, it's better than an ankle foot orthosis because it doesn't restrict the ankle to 90 degrees across the entire gait cycle. So what that does is not only does it allow the person to generate a plantar flexion angle during stance phase, but it also assists the plantar flexion and that ultimately leads to a improvement in propulsion. So what I'm showing you here is symmetry across the two legs and how much force they're able to generate. And you see unpowered to powered, this ultimately becomes about a 20% reduction in the asymmetry. And what I was saying earlier was that this propulsion symmetry is really highly related to economy, how much energy a person uses to walk. And if I look at economy, I see that there's a reduction, about a 30% reduction in the burden of walking due to a stroke. Zero here is the average of what people who don't have a stroke, healthy individuals, you or I, would, um, would be generating in terms of energy to walk a certain meter. And then people post-stroke, they're up here, and then with the exosuit on, just on, no training, just put it on and walk, you can see this 30% reduction in the energy utilized. And if you look at the relationship between improvements in propulsion and improvements in economy, you can see that they're tightly coupled. So those who improve their propulsion more with the exosuit, they have a better improvement in walking economy. Right? Now, we didn't want to stop there. So we're assisting the ankle, but clinicians across the board say, yeah, well, the ankle is the ankle. What about up the chain? And we're like, okay, let's, let's humor them a little bit. Let's look up the chain, even though we're assisting the ankle, we know it's going to have an effect up the chain. Let's show them that it actually will. So we looked at circumduction, hip hiking compensations. So these are, um, these are very common compensatory strategies that people post-stroke and other neurological diagnostic groups adopt to compensate for their impaired uh, paretic limb function. Circumduction is they see out, the foot goes out to the side and forward in order to clear the ground. And hip hiking, they use the hip muscles and the trunk muscles to lift that entire foot up off the ground. And you can imagine if you try this at home, it's very costly. 
It takes a lot of energy to use these hip muscles, these large muscles, to move the limb out and up when it should just be moving forward. Okay? And when you look at these two variables, with the exosuit powered here in red and unpowered here in gray, you can see that, uh, at least for this one individual, it's about half the reduction, so the seeing out, the circumduction, is cut in half. On average, across the seven people, we saw 20% reduction. And the hip hiking, this is how high it goes up. It's reduced when you power it on, on average, about 27% across individuals. So although we're assisting the ankle, we see positive changes up the chain, all the way up to the hip and the trunk. And we were encouraged by these results. So we took what we learned from these treadmill-based studies and developed a portable, fully autonomous exosuit that has since now become the Restore device. Um, and uh, we looked at two different uh, questions. The first one was the unpowered effect. Does simply wearing the device either cause a penalty? When my wife carries our son, who you know was pretty light, 10 pounds when he was first born, it, he, was, uh, he, he caused a penalty in how fast she could walk and how much energy that she needed to, to walk. And the, the, the exosuit is about 10, 10 pounds or so. Um, and we're like, well, does this cause a penalty to people post-stroke? And then the Iron Man effect is what I call it. It's like, hey, I'm wearing this fancy exosuit. Will I just be able to walk fast with the exosuit on my body, but not on in terms of power? Um, and so we wanted to look at that. And then uh, what we saw, we looked at two different outcomes, the distance that a person could walk and how much energy that they used to walk that distance. And we were uh, on one hand surprised, but also not surprised that when you put on the device unpowered, there was no decline, at least not a significant one between no suit and unpowered. And in terms of energy utilization to walk, there was no um, substantial, at least, increase in how much energy it required. And these were people post-stroke. And part of this is because of how we designed the device. The soft textiles are located distally down on the leg. That means as the body has to move that leg, it doesn't have to carry big, heavy motors or rigid items that are all located approximately around the waist, centrally located. So the penalty on how a person moves is minimal because of how the device was designed. And now we want to look at the powered effect. So if putting it on but not turning it on doesn't cause any harm, let's say it that way. When I put it on and I turn it on, how, how do people perform? And we looked at speed and distance. These are two most commonly looked at outcomes in, in neurological diagnostic groups. And when you go from unpowered to powered, people are walking farther in six minutes. They're achieving this to an increase in every single minute of the test in terms of how far they can walk. And their speed is also faster. This is the short distance speed, walking 10 meters, walking at a comfortable pace, usual speed, and then their maximum speed. And we see about 13 or 12% increase in their speed. Now, around this time, our team began working closely with Rewalk Robotics to develop a commercial adaptation of the Exosuit technology. And although functionally the same, the Rewalk Restore, as it came to be known, had major advances in the domain of clinical usability. In particular, a tablet-based graphical user interface allowed for clinicians to control the robotic assistance provided. And this is in contrast to a team of engineers following patients around while staring at their computer screens. And just recently, working with a fantastic group of PIs from across the country, we published the results of a multi-site clinical trial designed to evaluate safety, device reliability, and clinical feasibility of using the Restore exosuit to augment post-stroke rehabilitation efforts. Now, the particular study design and outcomes were selected to support a clinical device application to the United States Food and Drug Administration. But in addition to the safety, reliability, and feasibility outcomes um, that were primary in the study, we also included an exploratory evaluation of the potential therapeutic effects of gait training with exosuits. More specifically, the study provided 36 people post-stroke with five days of gait training with the exosuit, with each day consisting of up to 20 minutes of walking over ground and 20 minutes of walking on a treadmill. And what, this, what made this a therapeutic evaluation was that we looked at changes in patients' walking speed without the exosuit worn before and after five days of training. 
So our previous studies were looking at the effect of the exosuit worn, the immediate effect. For this study, this exploratory evaluation within this bigger study, we were looking at changes without the exosuit worn. Okay. So on average, after only five days of training, patients improved their maximum walking speed by 0.07 meters per second. Delving deeper and examining the changes at the individual patient level, we see that the vast majority, 64%, improved their walking speed by 0.05 meters per second, which is an important change threshold considered to be representative of a small, meaningful change. If we consider a larger change threshold of 0.1 meters per second, we see that after only five days of training, 36% of patients had a large meaningful change in walking speed. Now, five days of training is nowhere near the typical number of training days included in therapeutic studies, which are typically between 18 and 36 days of training. We would expect that with a longer training period, a greater subset of individuals would surpass this clinically meaningful change threshold. <clears throat> Moreover, we would expect that these so-called fast responders would have an even larger increase in walking speed. Now these and similar questions are what we are focusing on in our ongoing studies of the technology that also include an active control group to help us separate the effects of the exosuit from the effects of simply practicing walking. So stay tuned. And before I end, I just want to say that teamwork makes the dream work and acknowledge that I am truly blessed to be part of a dream team that is um, most dedicated and uh, brilliant folks this side of the sun. All right, thank you. Thanks, Lou, for such a, a thorough summary of you know the current exosuit research, and you know I really enjoy how how f looking at how far we've really come, just from you know our early days when we were looking at what does the suit do immediately to to an individual, to now starting to look at some of these therapeutic effects. Um, and you know, potentially looking at how long those therapeutic effects can be retained for. So right. it's exciting to see that trajectory and see how it's it's starting to come, you know, full circle right. basically. Um, you know, I think there's a few follow-up questions, and I think this is just you know for our viewers to help understand a little bit more about what research really entails and and kind of get them kind of more of a sneak preview behind the scenes of what this research um, really means. But my first question is actually, you know, if you could can step out of the lab for a second and, and put on your, your physical therapist hat instead of your clinical researcher hat, um, how, would you, how would you really advise therapists to interpret the big picture of this research that you've presented? You know, are we seeing anything that's really clinically meaningful that should suggest that we maybe, you know, should start incorporating this into our clinical practice? Yeah, thank you for it's a great question. Um, sometimes the gap between research and the clinic uh, is not immediately apparent. So, I, you know, my my impression again, putting on the physical therapist hat on, um, th this is a technology that we've been working on for um, close to five years now. That's left the lab, the research lab, and is now in the clinic. Um, and what it provides is an opportunity to target specific biomechanical impairment that we care about as clinical biomechanists, clinicians, uh, movement scientists, such as propulsion and ground clearance, right? And it allows us to target those deficits in a way that when we turn on the device, we can see these immediate substantial increases in speed and distance. So for me, there's a functional component that as a clinician I would really care about. Can I help my patient walk faster and farther? And then on the same, uh, in the same breath, they're walking faster and farther with a biomechanical gait pattern that's desirable, that we are targeting as movement scientists. So um, I would say that compared to other devices that exist on the market, this combines a lot of those benefits. Like you can use an AFO, you can use an FES system, you can use um, a locomat, you can use a rigid system to produce all of these effects. You got a single device here that can help people walk faster and farther with a better gait. So. Well, sorry. I think one of the things about neurorehabilitation research uh, that, that some people may not realize is that we're, we're generally working with a chronic stroke population uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, you know, partly because it's just logistically easier, um, but also partly because it's, it's easier to help us isolate the, the, 
results of a particular intervention from whether it's you know the actual intervention or whether it's some sort of spontaneous recovery. But you know, given that that most of your studies have been conducted with chronic stroke populations, how would you how would you suggest that we would interpret these results um, or translate them to a population that perhaps is a bit closer to their the recovery of in their neurological injury? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually get really excited when I think about the potential of using this technology in the earlier phases of post-stroke recovery. So part of the challenge that we have as clinicians in the inpatient setting is our patients need to move, right? They, they need to get around. We need to get them discharged, go home, you know, return to their life. So they're going to they're gonna find ways to move. They're going to find ways to get from point A to point B. And we help them along in that process by suggesting tools like the AFO, a cane, a walker. Um, but they also adopt particular strategies. And I talked about hip hiking and circumduction as particular compensatory strategies um, that are the result of lost uh, propulsion and lost ground clearance um, abilities that they have. So uh, when I take if you take a device like the exosuit, then the chronic phase can improve these deficits. That may be long-standing neuromotor changes, right? And you bring it to the acute phase or the inpatient phase um, uh, when people are still learning how to walk again after a stroke. Uh, what I find really exciting is that potential to alter the long-term trajectory. So you don't ever develop the um, uh, the, I don't want to call them negative compensations because they're critical in the time, right? With, without an exosuit, without any other solution, they are critical. They are important ways to restore mobility. Um, but they also become maladaptive later on, right? Like they are self, they are rate limiting, if that makes sense. You can't walk very fast in an efficient way if the way you walk is compensation based. It's based on uh, using strategies like circumduction, hip hiking. So if we can restore propulsion, we can restore typical ground clearance abilities by the product limb in the early phases, um, I would say that six months, one year, two years, five years down the line, we're going to see much better um, long-term effects than if you introduce this device in the chronic phase after they've already um, uh, learned how to walk a certain way. Uh, relearning a learned gait pattern uh, is much harder than um, teaching them right the first way, the first place. Yeah. yeah. And, and actually on that, that topic of learned gait patterns and compensations, um, that actually leads me into my next question, which is, you know, we, we actually had a talk a couple weeks ago about this idea of compensations and maladaptive neuroplasticity, um, and just really the, the idea that we're going to learn how to move. And, and if we learn with a compensation-based ba gate strategy, that's going to be potentially harder for us to unlearn. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know, one of the studies that you presented that is particularly exciting is the one that specifically looks at those reductions in hip hiking and reductions in circumduction that you were able to see um, if, if I'm correct, without any intervention from the physical therapist cueing for that at all, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so, you know, I think this is something that, that I think um, I just want to get a little bit more, you know, dig in a little deeper because it's interesting that we're only actually applying the assistance at the ankle, but yet we're seeing these changes at the knee and at the hip and kind of further up the kinematic chain. Um, right. So from a biomechanics perspective, can you comment on how we're actually able to, to see these changes or why we thought we would see these changes further up the chain when, when we're just applying assistance at the ankle? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, uh, at a high level, uh, sometimes the deficits that we see at the hip are because of problems at the ankle. And uh, there, there's one, one key problem, a functionally longer limb length that we think is the product of an impaired ability to flex the knee and dorsiflex the ankle. So when I walk, when you typically walk and you swing the limb through um, in the swing phase, there is a coordinated hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle dorsiflexion. Now the ankle dorsiflexion comes from the tibialis anterior, the muscles in front of the leg flexing and pulling up on the foot and causing the foot to dorsiflex. Now the knee flexion comes in part due to the push-off force that's being generated at terminal stance. And if you have a person post-stroke that doesn't have the ability to dorsiflex the ankle on their own volitionally, and they have impaired push-off, now they have impairments in their ability to flex the knee and dorsiflex the ankle. So that creates a limb that's too long to swing through. And um, 
if you could drop the ground underneath them, the limb would swing through, and that's one way to compensate for it. Now, we don't have the ability to drop the ground beneath them. Some folks at MIT have developed a machine, Skywalker, that can drop the, <laughs> the ground beneath people. We don't have access to that in the day-to-day -day walking, um, but we have the ability to restore dorsiflexion, the ability to restore push-off force. And in that study that you referenced, what we actually found was there was a relationship between improvements in knee flexion um, and improvements in the compensatory strategies, circumduction, hip hiking. So that just uh, further validates that hypothesis, that reasoning that a functionally longer limb is a result of impaired knee flexion, impaired dorsiflexion. If you have a device that can help restore push off and restore dorsiflexion, you can ultimately reduce compensations up the chain. So there are secondary compensations to the primary deviations that we might see at the ankle. And it's not true for everyone, but it turns out that in this subset of people with both stroke, it ended up being the case. And uh, it's in a large subset uh, overall. Yeah. Great. And then, you know, lastly, um, you know, you kind of alluded to some of the, the upcoming studies that you're working on in terms of looking further into this therapeutic benefit and, and looking into some of the retention um, and I know those studies are still ongoing, but is there anything that you can comment on um, in terms of, of the overall progression strategy that you're using in those studies to, to progress patients with an exosuit um, in order to achieve those therapeutic outcomes? Yeah, so the exosuit, um, it, there's um, a lot you can do with it, right? Because it's, um, it, it's meant to work in synchrony with the person, right? So almost anything you can envision doing with a person, a level ground walking, uh, you can do as part of your therapeutic program at the exosuit. So one thing that we've been thinking about are ways to progress how hard it is to walk with the exosuit on. So progressing the difficulty level. So part of that is like in, uh, progressing the environment that they walk in. So we might start them on the treadmill to help them get steps. Then we might put them over ground and then put them over ground walking long distances, short distances, um, distances that require lots of turns. So they have to decelerate, accelerate, turn. Um, think about stepping over obstacles uh, for some select participants. Um, and that's progressing the environment to make it a little bit harder. Another way that we've been thinking about doing it is uh, using what we call intermittent assistance. So when people are walking, they can get assistance from the device every single step that they take. And as they get assistance, uh, every step they take, they start adapting and learning how to walk with the exosuit powered on. And what we end up doing is we introduce, we interleave periods of taking the assistance away. So intermittent assistance. And during those periods, when we take the exosuit away, we, um, we work with the participant to replicate that gait pattern that they were feeling, that they were experiencing when the exosuit was powered on. But still, at the end of the day, it's still harder to walk. So we increase the challenge of walking. We help induce, um, uh, create opportunities to learn how to walk with a particular gait strategy by grading in and out the assistance. Um, and we're working on different ways to progress this and systematize, I think that's the word, right? <laughs> Make it more we'll systematic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, progression. <laughs> uh, these different, this, different uh, ways of using the technology. Um, and people can come in and they might find uh, it'd be uh, rather difficult to walk even on the treadmill. So we might spend a lot of time on the treadmill. Others that might come in, it's like, I can't wait to get over ground and walk faster, go over turns. So we individualize. So mm -hmm. a progression allows the individualization. Not everyone starts at the same point, but everyone follows the same rules as they progress along the program. And uh, we're working on it, but uh, so far the results have been pretty promising. And uh, I know we have a talk coming up um, in a couple of weeks as part of the series, presenting an early case report from some of the study. So stay tuned for that work. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll actually contain uh, links in the video description below of all of the studies that Lou presented today, um, as well as some additional resources for anybody that wants to learn a little bit more about exosuits or any exosuit research that's been conducted or ongoing. Um, so, Lou, thank you so much for a great talk. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to meet with us twice now about this, um, and hopefully we'll see you again at some point in the series. <laughs> great. Thanks for having me, Kathleen. All right. And to our viewers, we hope that you have been finding these talks educational and useful. Um, so don't forget to reach out in the comments section with, again, any of your research questions that you uh, have about exosuits or that you would like to see um, either addressed with current research or with upcoming research. Um, and please make sure to like and subscribe to this video if you haven't already. 
Um, and feel free again to use the comment section to suggest any future talks or speakers that you would like to see from us. We hope that you tune in with us again next week and have a great week, everyone.